What's up, people? Good afternoon. Happy Friday. Made it just about to the end of another work week. And we've got the final regular season pass rush Friday of the year. And not only in this video are we going to look at what happened in Game 17 against the Rams, which I'll tell you right now, not that you need to hear it from me to know, you probably knew it watching the game, went pretty good for the Seahawks. The Seahawks got decent pass rush on Baker Mayfield. So we'll talk about that, but we're also going to talk about the season as a whole and why this pass rush ultimately did not perform to my expectations or even like a NFL league average level of pressures. Um, I know that there's been some stuff said recently about, you know, we had sacks, right? We got a good number of sacks. You had um, Nwosu and Taylor combined for almost 20, I think 19 and a half. Um, you had Quentin Jefferson have five and a half. So right then and there, those three guys give you 25, and then you're picking up, I think, like three from your inside linebackers. You're picking up a couple from guys like Puna Ford, Shelby Harris. Um, I, I, you're picking up a few from guys like Mafe and Bruce Irvin came in and had like five or something like that. You add it all up, and you're like, it, I think it ends up somewhere around like 37 or 38 sacks on the year. Kobe Bryant had three, so some people are looking at that number of sacks, and they're saying, hey, this Seahawks pass rush is actually one of the better better pass rushes in the playoffs, but I, I have to push back on that because um, part of a pass rush is your pressures, and as we'll go over in this video, while we did end up with a decent number of sacks, we really struggled to maintain consistent quarterback pressure. And at the end of the day, sacks are just part of the picture when you're talking about a pass rush. It's a big part of the picture. But QB pressures lead to things like interceptions. A quarterback is pressured. He's on the move. He's not comfortable. He makes a throw that's bad. It gets picked off. That's even more valuable than a sack most of the time, right? So, therefore, I have to say that even though our sack numbers are probably pretty decent compared to the rest of the league... The pressures really needed to pick up. So we're going to start with the defensive line here, and as we go through, we're going to kind of break down where the disappointments came in, why we fell so short of expectations, and we'll get an idea of what needs to be done this offseason. I mean, I think we all kind of know. We need Mafe to get a lot better in 2023. We need to remake our defensive line. We need a healthy season from Jamal Adams. Uh, this is stuff that is fairly common sense to any regular Seahawks fan, I think, but... We're going to talk about it anyway, because to me, the defensive struggles really start here. So defensive line, Shelby Harris did not have a pressure against the Rams. Puna Ford, Al Woods did not. Adams and Collier did not. The only guy on the defensive line to get pressure in this game was Quentin Jefferson, who had two. And he has actually had nine quarterback pressures over the last four games. So he's been playing with his hair on fire a little bit. He has eight in the last three games in particular. He's really shown up when we needed somebody. And he's really the only guy who's shown up because if you look at the rest of the defensive line during that time period, it's been very little. So shout out to Quinn Jefferson. He actually exceeded my preseason expectations. He also played a lot more than I thought. But I mean, at the end of the day, he is by far the best defensive lineman we have at generating pressure. And... You can see where the shortcomings really came in. You had Shelby Harris. Last two years in Denver, Shelby Harris averaged 17 and a half pressures a season. This year, not even half. Fell all the way to eight. I, I don't know if that's a reflection of him not being as good of a player or it's a reflection of this team. It's hard to really know, but I don't feel like Shelby Harris is a bad player right now. I feel like that there are situational things going on here. And he could be a valuable piece again on a, on a defensive line. Um, but overall, what I would say is this. Puna Ford needs to be gone this offseason. Al Woods will probably retire. And if he does come back, he'll probably not be able to play that much. Monet's no good. Adams is whatever at this point. Collier needs to be way out of here. Shelby Harris and Quentin Jefferson are the two guys who I look at and go, they could be part of a good defensive line. But they need to be like your third best or fourth best or even fifth best defensive lineman. They can't be your top two guys. And going into next year, 
<coughs> with the guys who are expiring or likely retiring or moving on, Harris and Jefferson are your two best defensive linemen. So what I'm trying to say is we might need three new defensive linemen starters in 2023. Like Quentin Jefferson, maybe you could get away with starting him. Or Shelby Harris, maybe you could get away with starting him. But they cannot be your best or even your second best defensive lineman. I think they'll be fine in a third or fourth or even fifth best role. And that's basically the story of the defensive line. There's also Miles Adams, who I thought was maybe going to be the happy surprise of the year. But he ended up not really playing that much. So we've got, you know, two pressures from him. I don't think he did anything wrong. He just didn't play that much because the situations didn't allow for it. And that's the story of the defensive line for 2022. It, uh, 46 total pressures, 20 short of my preseason projection. Uh, Quinn Jefferson was kind of a happy surprise, but not good enough. Edge rusher. Let's take a look at the edge rushers here. So <clears throat> this Rams game actually went really well. They built on their success against the Jets. Taylor had a pressure, Mafe had a pressure, they both had a sack, and Nwosu had four pressures in this game. One of his best games of the year, actually. One of his best games he played all season, and he played some really good ones. So he turned it on there at the end when we needed it, and he ended up with, I believe, a sack and four pressures. And Bruce Irvin, maybe his best game of the year as well since he got back. He had two sacks, he had a tackle for loss. Uh, the two sacks represented here as the two pressures. And we can say that Bruce Irvin ended up being a little bit of a saving grace here. We didn't really get anything near what I was hoping for out of Taylor. And Alton Robinson was AWOL all season, didn't play a snap. So Bruce Irvin came in and played better than I expected and played more than I expected. Without him, the edge crop would have been really bad. But as it stands, it was just a little disappointing. I, I projected 85 in the preseason after Bruce Irvin came on, that is, you know, I added it to, um, I added it up from 80 to 85, and we ended up at 70. That's not good, but it's not a complete disaster the way that it easily could have been when Daryl Taylor was proving that he was starting to be on the outs. But Taylor actually bounced back and ended up with 21 pressures, which is reasonably respectable. Nwosu exceeded my expectations by a little bit. Um, he definitely was better in the first half of the year than the second half of the year, but even in the second half of the year, he still found ways to produce. He had games where he had multiple pressures several times in the second half of the year. He had, like, both games against the Rams, I thought he played really well. And for a guy who I viewed as maybe being a rotational piece going forward, he might be able to be your number one edge player, and you can feel pretty good about that. Mafe more or less lived up to my expectations. Uh, for whatever it's worth, PFF has him at 10 pressures. PFR has him at nine, at, at 8. So I guess you could take the average and say he has 9, but whatever. Either way, I didn't expect him to do a ton this year because he was so raw and he mostly played rundowns. So 8 pressures is totally fine. And the, the, gap, the gap between expectations and reality was mostly, you could say, Daryl Taylor not living up to expectations. Or you could say it was mostly Alton Robinson not playing. I thought Alton Robinson was going to have a nice little bounce back year. He didn't play a snap. And I don't know what's going on with him right now. I don't know if his career is over at this point. But I expected him to make it his way back at some point. Hopefully, hopefully next year. Because I still think there's something there that's intriguing. But we definitely didn't get to find out this year. And obviously I don't think Bruce Irvin will be back next year. So we're going to need something anyway. Okay, linebackers. Middle linebackers, this one's pretty simple. Uh, Jordan Brooks um, missed this game, so of course he didn't do anything. Cody Barton, no. Tanner Muse, Alexander Johnson didn't get anything. Nick Ballore didn't play linebacker in this game, I don't think. And at the end of the day, yeah, nothing from those guys. And on the, on the course of the year, you had nine QB pressures from inside linebackers. I projected 16 because I thought we were going to blitz more. I did. And part of the reason why you didn't is Jamal got hurt. And okay, I kind of get that. But I still think that a player as bad in coverage as, as Jordan Brooks needs to be blitzed more. So in 2023, if he comes back and you're playing him and, and you're trying to figure out if he's worth keeping around past 2023, last year of his rookie deal, if you don't pick up his option, then I, I think that um, you need to blitz him a little bit more. I'd love to see that. Adams or no, I don't care either way. 
get him in those blitzing situations. He's got to be better at it than he is in coverage. Cornerback, we actually had two pressures in this game from Kobe Bryant. He had a sack and he had another pressure where he flushed out Baker. And he ended up being the star of the show here on those nickel corner blitz. He had five pressures on the year. Nobody else did too much. Uh, Michael Jackson had one pressure on the season. And um, the uh, Ryan Neal, who ended up playing safety, had two to my count. So in terms of the actual cornerbacks, you had six. And almost all of them were from Kobe. That seems to be a part of his game that we're starting to embrace because, I mean, the last game he had double did I mean, he had double, how should I put this, uh, multiple pressures, excuse me. <laughs> so bring that back and use it in the playoffs, by the way, please. Send the blitz, send the house at Brock Purdy. But cornerbacks, I mean, I wasn't expecting much from the cornerbacks on the blitz and they m basically lived up to my expectations. Uh, safety, of course, when Jamal Adams gets hurt week one, you get what you get, right? Nobody can blitz like that guy. You got one pressure from Diggs, one from uh, Josh Jones, one from John Abram, and, of course, the two from Ryan Neal, which are, you know, he, he was playing safety this year, basically. And if you had Jamal Adams, you probably would have gotten to the expected tally, but you didn't, and you got nowhere close. So at the end of the day, the Seattle Seahawks had... 137 QB pressures by my count in 2022, the season. I expected way more. I expected 192. Now, if Jamal Adams played the whole year, we'd probably push up to like 150. I admit that. That's still well short. So it can't just be Jamal Adams. It has to be these other players like Daryl Taylor, like uh, sending more inside linebacker blitzes, like Shelby Harris, like defensive linemen just in general. A lot of disappointment in this pass rush but I can say they are playing some of their best football at the end of the year. So I'll see you guys later. Go Hawks. Let me know what you think. Big game tomorrow. Hope to see you guys there.